Next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the public have rightly been outraged that a double rapist changed their gender after being charged by the police. This week, the Justice Secretary, Keith Brown, was asked if that rapist should now be considered a woman. This is what Keith Brown said. I think that is the case. We have to accept people identify, as in this case, as women. Does the First Minister agree with her Justice Secretary? First Minister, um, I think that rapist uh, should be considered a rapist. Uh, that is what I think. Uh, that individual has been convicted of rapes um, and that therefore is the terminology. I'm not going to get into uh, the individual circumstances of uh, that particular uh, individual's uh, claims to be a woman because I don't have enough information uh, about that. But the individual has been convicted of serious sex offences um, and that is the uh, relevant consideration in terms of which prison uh, they should be accommodated in. Uh, can I say briefly, uh, Presiding Officer, in addition to this, uh, these issues uh, have obviously had uh, great public and media attention in recent days. But these issues are not new, uh, nor have the arrangements uh, within the prison service for dealing with transgender prisoners changed in any way. As the uh, chair of the Scottish Prison Officers Association said this week, uh, the Scottish Prison Service has been making risk-based decisions about the accommodation of trans prisoners for many years, and indeed they have been doing that effectively and safely. Uh, the risk assessment processes in the cases that have been reported in recent days were underway. It is not the case that any decision had been taken to allow either of those to serve their sentences in women's uh, prisons. However, given the nature of the coverage and the potential for that uh, to cause concern, I think the reality for that to cause concern amongst women prisoners and the general population, and indeed to cause distress in the trans community, uh, the overwhelming majority of whom, whom, like the overwhelming majority of the general population, never commit any offences, yeah. uh, led us uh, to clarify the matter and put it beyond doubt. Um, and the position now, of course, pending the review that was already underway, is that no transgender prisoner uh, with a history of violence, including sexual violence against women, uh, will be housed in or transferred to a women's prison. Um, I think that is what is important, and I think it is that clarity that matters to the public. Douglas Ross. The, the First Minister's final words there were about clarity. I, I think that answer was anything but clear. Her Justice Secretary is very clear that he thinks a double rapist is a woman. He has enough information to come to that conclusion. The First Minister says she does not have enough information uh, to come to that conclusion. Uh, but I do want to look at an area where we agree. Trans people uh, are not the problem here. But here is where we disagree. When a man rapes two women, we do not think that he should be considered a woman just because he says so. We should call out criminals like this who are abusing the system. They are not trans people. They are dangerous and violent men. Adam Graham, who wants to be known as Isla Bryson, raped two women. He is an abusive man seeking to exploit loopholes in the government's current policy. Nicola Sturgeon's answer to me was she wants to call a rapist a rapist. But can she just give me a clear answer to my question, not what she wants to answer, but what I want to ask her, is this double rapist a woman? First Minister. Uh, this individual claims to be a woman. What I said is that I do not have information uh, about whether uh, those claims have validity or not. But I do not think Douglas Ross and I are disagreeing here, because what I think is relevant in this case is not whether the individual uh, is a man or, or claims to be a woman or is uh, trans. What is relevant is that the individual is a rapist. Uh, that is how the individual should be described, and it is that uh, that should be the main consideration in deciding how the individual is dealt with. Uh, that is why, of course, uh, the individual uh, is in uh, a male prison, not in uh, the female prison. Uh, so these uh, are the issues that matter. Uh, Douglas Ross also talks about current policy. I accept he has not done this today, but I have read many things in recent days that have tried to conflate the situation 
uh, in prisons with the legislation passed overwhelmingly by this parliament before Christmas. Of course, the two are not connected and yeah. they wouldn't be connected even if that legislation was in force, which it is not. The current policy, which is, in my understanding, broadly similar uh, to the approach he's taken in other jurisdictions, has been in place in the Scottish Prison Service since 2014. Uh, and as the chair of the Prison Officers Association said himself this week, uh, the prison service has been taking risk-based decisions about transgender prisoners for many years, and they have been doing that safely and effectively. Um, and that is what they should continue to do, uh, albeit uh, with the presumptions that were set out for clarity at the weekend. Douglas Jones. The First Minister is right. I haven't mentioned the, the GRR bill at all. I'm, I'm speaking about the current government policy, the, the Scottish government policy I have in front of me here, which states it is the view of the Scottish government that trans women are women. It's the view of her Justice Secretary that a double rapist uh, is a woman. I, I'm not sure what the First Minister's view on that is, because she says there's no disagreement between herself and I on this. There is a, a massive disagreement. I believe a double rapist, anyone who rapes a woman, is a man. They cannot be considered uh, anything else. And, and, Presiding Officer, this all matters for very good reasons. It matters because what happens when violent criminals like Adam Graham get out of prison? Under Nicola Sturgeon's current government policies, the ones I've just spoken about that she raised, he is considered a woman. That means sex offenders like him can keep forcing their way into women's spaces. Adam Graham was already able to uh, access a beauty class after raping two women. 21-year-old Rachel Ferguson was in that class with him and told the newspaper this. It really scares me to look back and realise that he was watching me with no clothes on after being charged with this. It makes me feel physically sick and violated. This is a fundamental question about women's safety. I refuse to trust the word of a rapist. Why does the First Minister? First Minister. Um, I don't, and nothing I have said suggests that I do. But can I uh, set out the reality here? And I think it is important that in rightly uh, dealing with and me answering questions about this uh, individual case, very serious individual case, uh, we also remember, uh, and it does bear repeti repetition, uh, that trans women are a, a very tiny proportion of our society, but the overwhelming uh, number of them never commit any offences uh, of any description, just like it is true for the overwhelming majority of the general population. And in deal dealing with individuals like this, uh, who have to be dealt with very seriously, it is important uh, that we don't inadvertently undermine the rights of the law-abiding majority of trans people in our country. And I think that is an important principle that we mustn't lose sight of. Uh, but rapists should be dealt with as rapists. Uh, I don't think there is any disagreement on that. And I don't think it does service uh, to the victims of crime to suggest that we somehow do disagree on that issue. In terms of access to single-sex spaces, it is also the case that under current law, under the current Equality Act, uh, which of course is legislation reserved to the UK Parliament, uh, there are provisions to exclude uh, trans women from single sex spaces. And those exemptions can be applied whether or not a trans woman has a gender recognition certificate. So it's important that as we discuss uh, these important issues, uh, we do so firstly calmly, and I recognise we're having a calm exchange right now, but that we also do it without misrepresenting, even inadvertently, the position, because I don't think that does a service to uh, the trans community more generally, but I don't think it does a service to the victims uh, of male violence against uh, women, and it doesn't do any service to the population at large. Uh, the final point I would remind Douglas Ross of, which is a point I have made before, and I, I don't stand here pretending to speak for them, 
But organisations like Rape Crisis Scotland, uh, like uh, Scottish Women's Aid, uh, these are organisations that deal day and daily with women who have been the victims uh, of male violence against them. Not only were they supportive of the legislation, but they deal with these issues uh, and they deal with the situation around trans women each and every day. And I think all of us uh, could do with listening more uh, to them because they are in many respects the experts in their field. Douglas Ross. We are having a, a calm debate, and I think that is right for this sensitive issue. But I am feeling frustrated, as I was last week, that I have asked the First Minister repeatedly for an answer that she refuses to give. Under law, a rapist has to be a man. Her Justice Secretary thinks this rapist is a woman. And I just like, in my final opportunity to the First Minister, to get a clear answer. Is Adam Graham, this double rapist, a man or a woman? Now, let's remember, in court, this man lied. He was telling people he didn't rape two women. But under Nicola Sturgeon's policy, he's believed when he claims to be a woman. So he can keep on demanding access to women's spaces. He can keep forcing victims to call him she. He can keep terrifying and traumatising women. I, I know there's, there's murmurings from the SNP benches, so I would ask them and, and the First Minister to listen to the words of one of Adam Graham's victims. This survivor was raped by him and said this on Sunday. I don't believe a word. I don't believe he's truly transgender. I feel as if he's made a mockery out of them using it. As far as I'm concerned, that was to make things easier for himself. I'm sure he's faking it. And this brave woman summed up the feeling of the majority of people in Scotland when she said this. You've got genuine cases where people are desperate to get reassignment for the right reasons because they've been born into that body, not because they raped two people and decided that that's an easy way out. First Minister, why are you giving rapists an easy way out? First Minister. I, I, I do think that does a disservice to, to victims of crime. Can I, I say a, a number of things because they are all extremely important. Uh, the, the quote uh, that Douglas Ross narrated there, um, my feeling is that is uh, almost certainly the case, um, which is why the key, factor, the key factor in this case is not the individual's claim to be a woman. The key and in, in fact, only important factor in this case is that the individual has been convicted of rape. Yeah. The individual is a rapist, and that is the factor yeah. that should uh, be the deciding one in decisions uh, about how that prisoner is now uh, treated. Um, and indeed, that is what is happening in terms of, of where the prisoner is. Uh, secondly, uh, Douglas Ross has, on more than one occasion today, uh, used the terminology of forcing access to women's only spaces. These are important considerations, uh, but that language uh, ignores the exemptions under the current equality yeah. law, a law that even if this parliament wanted to, couldn't change. Uh, exemptions that enable trans uh, women to be excluded from single-sex spaces uh, where the tests in that legislation are met um, and to be excluded uh, regardless of whether or not uh, they have a gender recognition certificate. Uh, the other uh, thing that Douglas Ross's questions ignore is the fact that for any sex offenders on release of prison, uh, there are monitoring arrangements, the, the MAPA, the well-established MAPA arrangements, to ensure that any continuing risk posed by individuals, uh, regardless of gender, uh, are properly managed. So it is really important that we uh, look seriously uh, at all of these issues, uh, but that in doing so, uh, we bear in mind two things. Firstly, as I've said, uh, that we do not further stigmatise uh, trans people generally, and I think that is important. Uh, but secondly, that we don't cause undue concern amongst the public. If there are issues to be addressed, we address them. But we do that 
in a way that is not just calm but doesn't misrepresent yeah. the situation because that is in nobody's interest. And I think if all of us uh, come at these debates in that spirit, then uh, we can work our way through all of these issues, respecting the rights of those whose rights deserve to be respected, uh, but also protecting the public and women in particular from men who want to and do commit violent acts against them. Yeah, Question number two, Anna Sarwa. Presiding officer, for the past 15 years, this government has shortchanged local councils. It didn't matter if the Scottish government's budget went up or down, local authorities had their budgets cut, and now they are at financial breaking point. Two of Scotland's most senior councillors said this week, council services face being either significantly reduced, cut or stopped altogether. Local authorities will have to consider cutting pupil support staff, libraries, youth work and other vital services. Are these councillors wrong? First Minister. Uh, councillors are not wrong to say that we live in times of real financial difficulty and constraint. That's true of the Scottish Government and it is absolutely true of councils uh, across our country. Um, this time every year, I think I made this comment a couple of weeks ago, uh, we hear these kind of questions uh, as councils look at options put before them. Often these options uh, are not taken forward, uh, but it is important that all councils uh, look carefully at how they balance uh, their budgets, but do that in a way uh, that also fulfils uh, their priorities. In the budget for the financial year about to start, and of course Parliament will debate the budget at stage one uh, this afternoon, uh, we are proposing an increase in the resources available to local government of over uh, £570 million. Uh, that is a, a real terms increase of £160 million million pounds. Uh, so times are difficult for local government, but within the constrained financial resources that we have, of course, resources increased by decisions uh, we are also taking and proposing to Parliament to ask uh, those who earn the most to pay a bit more. Uh, we are treating local government as fairly as we possibly can. The final point I would make, Presiding Officer, and it's an invitation to Anna Sarwar and to anyone across the Chamber. If there is a proposition to give more money as we go through this budget process to local government, by all means come and make that suggestion, but tell us where in the budget we should take uh, that money from. That's the only grown-up and mature way uh, to come to budget deliberations. Anna Sarwa. Why are these councillors considering budget cuts? They're considering cuts because of decisions made by this government. £6 billion of core budget cuts since 2013-14. And those words I quoted were the words of SNP councillors Shona Morrison and Katie Hagman, the President and Resource Spokespersons of COSLA. Two SNP councillors brave enough to say out loud what this SNP government knows is the truth. Councillor Hagman also said councils are left with little choice other than to potentially raise council tax, raise our fees and charges, or cut or potentially even stop our vital services that we are currently providing. And when asked if council tax may have to rise by as much as 10%, she said, all options are very much on the table. The public are being asked to foot the bill for public services that are getting worse by the week because this government underfunded councils for 15 years. First Minister, why are people across Scotland being asked to pay more for less? First Minister. Well, that is, is not the case, but let me repeat the offer I've made to Anna Sarwar. We will, as a parliament, debate the budget for next year at stage one this afternoon. Uh, the budget uh, proposals will then go through the other stages before the budget is passed uh, by parliament as a whole. Now, we have put forward a balanced budget. We've allocated all of the resources we have at our disposal. Uh, within that budget, uh, we are increasing uh, local government resources by over half a billion pounds. But if Anna Sarwar is saying uh, that he thinks local government should get more money than that, then let him bring forward that proposal. But also tell us, uh, because there is no unallocated pot of cash, tell us where we should take the extra money from. Should it be from the National Health Service? Should it be from the police? Should it be from the central government education budgets? These are, are real questions. Yep. Uh, that if Anna Sarwar is standing here arguing for a bigger increase for local government, which you know, is legitimate, he has a right to do that, but if he wants to be taken seriously, he also has to say where that money yep. should come from. So I'm waiting. I'm open to any suggestion that Anna Sarwar wants to make. Anna Sarwar. What the First Minister wants to ignore is all the waste this government is doing, the vanity projects, the money hidden behind the sofa for the deal for the Greens, 
all that, all that cuts that they've had right across this country. She knows that she has taken the decisions that have slashed council budgets because for 15 years the SNP have underfounded councils. Even her ministers, even when her ministers had more money to spend, hear Mr. and now Sarwar. people across Scotland are facing the double whammy of increased income taxes and hikes in council tax. That means taxes will go up, not just for the richest, but almost every household in Scotland, but services will still be cut. And now a leaked COSLA document reveals potential job losses on a massive scale. They estimate over 7,000 jobs will be lost. 7,000. And this is what council leaders in her own party say. This budget settlement will have a detrimental impact on vital local services. It will lead to the loss of jobs both within local authorities and within the local companies who supply goods and services to councils. After 15 years of command and control, things have gone so bad that many of Nicola Sturgeon's own colleagues are no longer willing to blindly follow the orders. Her MPs have lost faith in the strategy. Her councillors have lost faith in her decisions and now her MSPs face a choice. Will they vote through these cuts or will they finally, finally stand up for their local communities? First Minister. Uh, the, 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 the problem for Anna Sarwar is the verdict of the Scottish people that yeah. matters, which is why I'm standing uh, here and absolutely. he is sitting over there. But Anna Sarwar has just demonstrated there, I think, that he does not yet deserve to be taken seriously uh, in these exchanges because, you know, absolutely correct to say uh, that these are really difficult times for local government as they are for central government when it comes to the allocation of resources. We have put a draft budget before Parliament, uh, and I stress that word, draft budget. Parliament is about to debate it. So if there is, and all of the resources we have are allocated within that draft budget, so if it is Anna Sarwar's proposition that he would like to see more money go to local government, uh, then that is a legitimate proposal to make. But he has to say where he wants us to take that money from, because it would have to come from the National Health Service or the police budget or other budgets. So Anna Sarwar has the opportunity, and I will wait to hear uh, whether this proposition comes from Labour this afternoon, if he wants us to increase the allocation to local government, uh, he has to see us reduce the allocation to some uh, other part uh, of, of our budget. So let us know where he thinks that should come from, and then perhaps we can have uh, a proper grown-up discussion uh, other than the one uh, that he has just uh, had us have uh, this afternoon. Question number three, Alex Cole-Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, um, when we are told to run from danger, our emergency workers run towards it. And last week, Edinburgh firefighter Barry Martin did just that and paid the ultimate price for so doing. Uh, I hope that the First Minister will join me in paying tribute to Barry and support our efforts to see him posthumously awarded the George Cross, the highest award for civilian gallantry. to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, the Cabinet will meet on Tuesday. Uh, Office, can I also take the opportunity to convey my deepest condolences to the family, uh, the friends and the colleagues of firefighter Barry Martin. Uh, he typifies uh, the bravery and the courage of all of our emergency service workers, uh, but in particular our firefighters. I have uh, written to firefighter uh, Martin's family, but the thoughts of everyone across the chamber uh, are very much with them at this time. Um, and I hope uh, at this horrendously sad time for them, they will take some comfort uh, from the love that has been expressed from all who knew and worked with Barry. Alex Cole Hamilton. I am particularly grateful for that reply. Uh, can I remind the Chamber that my wife is a primary school teacher and a member of the EIS. Presiding officer, after the disruption of the pandemic, we have calculated that Scotland school pupils have now lost over two million days of education due to strike action. That will double if an agreement is not reached. Today, it's Dundee and Argyll and Butte. Tomorrow, it's South Lanarkshire and the Western Isles. Teachers care deeply about their pupils and closing the gates is the last thing that they want to do. But the last pay offer was made to them back in November and there has been nothing new since. Presiding officer, this generation of young people has had it harder than any other and life qualifying exams are coming over the horizon. 
Waiting for teachers to buckle or inflation to fall is not a strategy. So can I ask the First Minister, what will she do personally to keep those school gates open? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I agree that uh, no one, and I certainly don't want to see disruption or any further disruption to children's education, uh, Alec Cole Hamilton is right uh, to point to the disruption that COVID caused uh, to children and young people. Can I also uh, share and echo uh, the respect uh, he has expressed for our teachers? Uh, I very much hope we will uh, reach a resolution and a pay agreement uh, soon that avoids further disruption, uh, but it is important uh, that that continues to be discussed and no negotiated uh, through the mechanisms that are in place. Uh, the final thing I would say, and I've said this before, uh, the government is not simply digging its heels in. Any resolution has to be fair and it has to be affordable. Um, and I think uh, we can point uh, to the fact that we don't uh, simply dig our heels in to, to other pay negotiations where we have uh, managed to reach resolutions that have avoided industrial action in other public services. So we will continue to seek that fair and affordable uh, resolution uh, with teachers that continues to reward them uh, for the excellent work that they do. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister what discussions the Scottish Government has had with COSLA with regard to proposals in some local authorities to reduce teacher numbers, given its commitment to increase teacher numbers by 3,500 by end of the current parliamentary session. First Minister. Well, I am very firmly of the view that a reduction in teacher numbers would not be in keeping with our commitment to raise attainment and close the attainment gap in our schools. Uh, indeed, as Christine Graham has set out, this government is committed to recruiting additional teachers and classroom assistants. We have provided an additional £145.5 million in this year's budget specifically to recruit additional teachers. That funding will also be included in next year's budget for councils as part of our ongoing commitments on teacher numbers. Deputy First Minister and the Education Secretary met with local government representatives on Tuesday to discuss how we best deliver on this commitment and also protect learning hours. And the Education Secretary will set out further uh, steps to the Scottish Parliament over the coming days. Christine Graham. I thank the First Minister for her answer. As a former secondary teacher myself, though some time ago, I have huge regard for the commitment of the profession and indeed benefited as someone from a working class background to state education through to university. But context is all. And budgets are under severe pressure as a result of 10% inflation at Scottish and local government level, with the same pressures in Wales and England where teachers are on strike. The issue of funding for education is not a Scottish government problem, it's a UK-wide one and a direct consequence of raging inflation which Anna Sarwar in his exchange with the First Minister sidestepped. Is it not time, First Minister, that Rishi Sunak ditched his current policy of austerity yeah. to tackle their own self-inflicted inflation, increased funding to this government and Wales while they're at it, dealing with the fallout of a decade of failed Tory policies, exacerbated by Brexit, Thank you. a revolving door of four Tory councillors in one year, and who could forget Liz Truss? First Minister. Uh, Christine Graham is absolutely correct and the, the discomfort on the Conservative benches was palpable while she was speaking. I also detected a bit of discomfort in the Labour benches. I'm not quite so sure why that should be the case. But the fact of the matter is uh, the budget that this government works within is constrained uh, by decisions taken by UK governments uh, who still hold uh, most of the financial levers. But within that, we are doing everything we can to protect public services and secure the fairest possible pay deals for those who work within our public services. But Christine Graham is right. This parliament, this government would be able to do so much more if Rishi Sunak loosened the purse strings, uh, started to negotiate fair pay deals with public sector workers in England uh, and increase funding to the devolved administrations. And surely that's something all of us across this chamber should unite to call for. Stephen Kerr. Well, what we have heard is a bizarre question followed by a bizarre answer. This is a bizarre situation that only Nicola Sturgeon could have concocted. The SNP government now reportedly threatening to sanction local councils because of SNP underfunding. 
the, the First Minister is forcing councils to choose between deep cuts to local services or above inflation tax increases? Or how exactly does she expect them to pay for her commitment to increase teacher numbers? First Minister. It's only a couple of weeks uh, that uh, the member's leader in this parliament was saying that the government had to ensure there was no yeah. reductions to teacher numbers. Yeah. So I think the Tories yeah. should make up their minds yeah, which side yeah, they are on. But if Stephen Kerr uh, wants this government to allocate more resources to local government uh, or to any other part of the public uh, service, then either uh, he, like I, I challenged Anna Sarwar to do earlier on, has to tell us where that money should come from, uh, or perhaps they should call uh, on their bosses at Westminster to deliver more funding uh, for the devolved administrations. Uh, and finally, presiding officer, uh, they should probably drop uh, their call for tax cuts for the richest yeah. in our society. Yeah. I, I saw, I think, Liz Smith uh, just this morning uh, say that one of the priorities for the Scottish Government in our budget should be to narrow the tax gap between Scotland and the rest of the UK. Uh, that tax gap is because we are asking those who earn the most to pay a bit more, which obviously means the Tories still want to see uh, tax cuts for the richest, which would reduce funding for public services. There's no consistency or principle whatsoever coming from the Tory benches. Question number five, Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what schemes the Scottish Government has in place to support disabled people with the energy costs of running life-saving and independent living equipment at home. First Minister. High energy prices, uh, along with the wider cost of living crisis, are causing extreme uh, challenges for many people right now. Uh, we provide a range of disability benefits to help disabled people and those with long-term conditions. The Child Winter Heating Assistance and Carers Allowance Supplement are providing financial support uh, available only in Scotland. Uh, as does our new winter heating payment, which will begin in a few weeks' time. We have also doubled the Fuel and Security Fund to £20 million, and some patients using haemodialysis or oxygen equipment at home are already accessing financial support. It is, of course, deeply regrettable that the UK Government is cutting the support provided to hard-pressed families from the end of March. Uh, I hope they will reverse this decision, and I hope members across the Chamber will call on them to do so uh, and continue to provide the assistance that households so badly need at this time. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, First Minister, uh, obviously given the cost of running life-saving equipment, such as a ventilator, can reach as much as £750 a month, does the First Minister agree that the energy costs are putting the health and human rights of disabled people at risk? And will the Scottish Government commit to an urgent meeting with myself, stakeholders, to discuss urgent action to support families to run life-saving and independent living equipment? First Minister. I am uh, happy to ask the relevant minister to take part in such a, a meeting um, and we would be happy to discuss what more the Scottish Government can do. I, I do agree with Jeremy Balfour about the impact of sky-high energy costs, which is why I think the UK Government that holds the levers here really has to do much more to help people with the impact of those sky-high energy costs. Uh, this Government is doing everything we can within our powers and resources. I have pointed to the range of disability benefits that we provide and also in particular the doubling of the Fuel and Security Fund to £20 million, uh, which will help uh, some of those dealing with the kind of impacts that Jeremy Balfour sets out. Uh, so we will continue to look at what more we can do, uh, but it really does need to be the UK Government here that acts uh, to deal with the root causes of rising energy prices, but also takes action now to help those dealing with the impact of them. Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We know that the cost of living crisis is being felt most acutely by those with caring responsibilities or those in receipt of care. The Scottish Government commissioned the independent review of adult social care, which included a recommendation to scrap non-residential care charges, but we know that action has not been forthcoming to deliver that recommendation. The removal of non-residential social care charges would overnight improve the lives of over 100,000 people in Scotland by relieving the financial pressure on their households. So I will ask the First Minister, why has she failed to listen to the experts like Derek Feely and scrap non-residential care charges? First Minister. 
Uh, the commitment we gave on that, and I agree this is an important issue, uh, was to achieve that uh, over the course of this parliamentary term, and we're currently looking uh, to see uh, how quickly that might be possible within yeah. the financial constraints that we are talking about. I absolutely recognise uh, how important an issue this is, uh, but uh, we have to deal within the, the budgets that we have. Uh, I repeat uh, again what I said to Anna Sarwar earlier on. Within the context of the budget for next year, if any member wants to propose additional funding uh, for any line in that budget, uh, then they are of course entitled to do so. Uh, but they have to accompany that with an explanation of where they think those additional resources should come from. That is the hard part of setting budgets, and oppositions uh, who want to propose extra money uh, for parts of the budget really cannot escape that responsibility. Question number six, Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to research commissioned by Citizens Advice Scotland reportedly finding that people are struggling to afford everyday goods, including period and hygiene products, and the energy costs associated with showering, bathing and laundry due to the cost of living crisis. First Minister. Uh, we remain very concerned about the hardship people are facing right now due to the cost of living crisis, which of course is not yet abating. Uh, the majority of the key policy levers are, of course, held by the UK Government, including those related to energy bills. Uh, we will continue to press the UK Government to use all of the levers at their disposal to tackle this emergency on the scale that is required. In the meantime, we will continue to do all we can to help households uh, within the limited budgets and powers that we have. Uh, we have allocated almost £3 billion in this financial year on initiatives to help people with the cost of living crisis, and that includes uh, £1 billion that provides services and support that is not available anywhere else in the UK. Uh, as I said in response to the previous question, we have also doubled the Fuel and Security Fund to £20 million this year and recently announced £2.4 million for action to help tackle food insecurity. Monica Lennon. I thank the First Minister for her response. Um, I'll follow up on two points on, on levers that, that we do have here. Since the Period Products Act took legal effect last August, um, I think we've all been hugely impressed by the work being done by council schools and others to make free period products widely available. Along with period dignity campaigners, I'm keen to meet with the Social Justice uh, Cabinet Secretary to discuss ways to build on this success so that we can raise more awareness and help the people highlighted in this Citizens Advice Scotland survey. And secondly, we all know that rip-off energy bills are exploiting people and putting their lives at risk. The whole rotten system needs to be dismantled, but in the meantime, people do need urgent support. Can the First Minister guarantee that everyone who is due the winter heating payment in Scotland will receive it this month? First Minister. Social Security Scotland is taking uh, forward uh, the rollout of benefits and, uh, of course, it is always the priority to make sure that people uh, get benefits to which they are entitled as quickly as possible. Um, in terms of uh, wider issues around energy bills, I have covered that in response to a previous question, but it is important that we continue to consider everything we can do, but the key levers here do lie with the UK Government. On the issue of period poverty, I think all of us across uh, this chamber and Monica Lennon uh, clearly was uh, a key person in this, should be proud of the progress around tackling period poverty. Uh, she is right to point uh, to the progress that has been made, but she is also right to say that we should collectively look at how we now build on that. So I know the Social Justice Secretary would be happy to meet with her uh, and campaigners uh, to discuss exactly uh, how we take that forward. And I hope on this, uh, if perhaps not on many other issues uh, that we discuss in this chamber, we can build some uh, real consensus uh, for the future. We move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Natalie Dunn. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. New analysis by the International Monetary Fund has found that the UK is set to be the only major economy to shrink in 2023, with all other developed nations experiencing growth. Even sanction hit Russia. This, on top of everything else, will severely impact on devolved nations and our responsibilities. Why does the First Minister think that the UK is performing so poorly compared to other economies? Could it be the perfect storm of Westminster economic incompetence and a disastrous Brexit that Scotland didn't vote for? First Minister. Uh, Nat Natalie Dawn is absolutely right. And again, uh, there is real discomfort, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, from the Tory branches. Perhaps they've just seen uh, that 
uh, another consequence of Tory economic and financial incompetence and mismanagement is that interest rates have just uh, been increased yet again uh, by the Bank of England, which has real implications uh, for people. But the forecast by the IMF uh, is deeply worrying, but it should come as no surprise. The Scottish Government and others in Scotland have repeatedly warned uh, that Brexit, and particularly the hard Brexit chosen by the UK Government, would be devastating to the economy of Scotland and to the UK as a whole. The economic impacts are already being felt. Uh, Britain's GDP was 5.5 per cent lower uh, by the second quarter of 2022 than it would have been had Brexit not occurred. Uh, the consequences of this economic incompetence are devastating stating for businesses and for individuals alike. Uh, and thanks to Brexit, the UK is facing a worse cost of living crisis than elsewhere. Uh, so First that's the reality. And I think it's time that the UK government and indeed the main opposition at UK uh, level woke up to that fact uh, and abandoned uh, the disaster that has been Brexit. Thank you, First Minister. I call Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The British Heart Foundation are here in Parliament today to raise awareness of the importance of learning CPR. My constituent, Stephanie Bain, had to perform CPR on her five-week-old baby after he stopped breathing in his cot. Neither Stephanie or her partner knew how to do CPR on a baby, and I can only imagine how terrifying it must have been for them and their family. The family is now urging parents to learn vital first aid skills that could save the lives of their young children. My office has been in touch with Stephanie and I am pleased that Finlay is now doing well. I have also reached out to the British Heart Foundation to encourage them to create digital content showing parents how to perform CPR on children under the age of one. First Minister, as February is Heart Month, will you support the campaign to ensure everyone, especially parents, has access to CPR training as it does save lives? First Minister. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I, I will. I'm, I'm very happy to give my support to that campaign. Let me also welcome uh, the British Heart Foundation to Parliament today and, and commend uh, the organisation for the excellent work uh, that it does. Uh, the work it does, I know, has uh, an impact on families across uh, Scotland and we're very grateful to them for that. I think it is important uh, that we work to raise awareness uh, of and education and training about CPR. I understand the British Heart Foundation itself has an online tool uh, about CPR, uh, Revive R, uh, and that's important, but there is clearly more work uh, we can all do collectively, and I'm happy to give my support to that and to consider what more the Scottish Government uh, can do to support these efforts. Faisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the, Millennium, uh, the Muirhouse Millennium Centre in my region is facing financial difficulty, and several meetings have now been held to address their concern about the lack of future core funding, which could mean the risk of closure. When community centres are not funded properly, it is not just the centre who loses out. The families who depend on them for support and help, particularly during the cost of living crisis, are left without a lifeline. Will the First Minister increase funding to local authorities to ensure that they have the necessary funds to support essential community centres such as the Muirhouse Millennium Centre? First Minister. Well, I, I know from my own constituency the importance of community centres and uh, community facilities more generally, so I certainly agree with the sentiment being expressed. Uh, clearly, uh, the individual issue raised is one for the local council. In terms of the central request, uh, will the Scottish Government increase uh, further uh, the allocation to local councils? I said earlier on, the draft budget already proposes an increase in resources to local government of more than half a billion pounds. But as I said to the member's leader uh, some moments ago, if Labour want to further increase that allocation, uh, then they are entitled to put forward that proposition, but they need to point to the line in the budget uh, where they think we should take that money from. Uh, and we'll await uh, this afternoon uh, and for the remainder of the budget process to see where, whether any uh, balanced proposals in that regard come from the Labour benches. Uh, but I will not be holding my breath based on the experience of past years. Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. This week marks the third anniversary of Brexit, and last night in the BBC we heard Dr Donald McCaskill of Scottish Care outline the devastating impact it's having on our social care and health centre. Dr McCaskill said, We have lost thousands of frontline staff because of Brexit and an immovable visa system and immigration system from Westminster. Does the First Minister agree with Dr McCaskill? And if so, what does she think needs to happen to secure a better future for the sectors? 
First Minister. Yes, I, I do agree with Donald McCaskill, and uh, I think his comments uh, last night uh, were very clear when he did say uh, that we've lost thousands of frontline staff in nursing and in direct social care because of uh, Brexit and because of the, the visa and immigration system from Westminster. Of course, the wider cost crisis also has an impact. Uh, we need, as a country, in my view, to find a way back uh, to Europe. We need, as a country, uh, to find a way of ensuring that we have an immigration system uh, that is not just humane, but that me meets our social and economic needs. It is clear, and it's becoming clearer every day, that Scotland will not find either of those things uh, as part of the Westminster system of government. The route to both of them is through Scotland becoming an independent country. Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer. Incredibly, there is still no operational blueprint for deposit return, despite the scheme launching in just a few months' time. No wonder businesses are tearing their hair out. Retailers are investing a quarter of a billion pounds in the scheme this year alone, but they are being forced to take a best guess at how it is going to work. The Scottish Retail Consortium is now calling for a complete operational blueprint to be released by the end of the month. Can the First Minister confirm that will happen, yes or no? First Minister. Circularity Scotland uh, continues to work uh, with businesses as they uh, finalise operational delivery plans ahead of the launch in August and it of course is developing and constructing the logistical network uh, that will support the effective operation of the scheme. I will ask Lorna Slater, the relevant minister, uh, to write further uh, to the member to set out further details of the steps being taken between now and launch in August. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, President Officer. Last night it was confirmed that the Government cannot guarantee that the winter heating payments will be paid this month. And as the First Minister has just said in response to my colleague, um, they have said that it is DWP data that's the issue. Ministers set the deadline for the DWP to share that necessary data of the 31st of January. The Minister confirmed in committee that the payments would be made in February if they got that data. They did. So can I ask the First Minister, has the Government failed to properly plan for the delivery of this payment? Have they underestimated the time needed to properly execute the policy? And will our constituents get it this month, or will the winter heating payment end up being the Scottish summer payment paid too late to keep people warm this winter? First Minister. We will continue, as we have done uh, with all benefits, to ensure that people who are entitled to these benefits uh, get the money timiously. Uh, we did receive the data from the DWP and payments will be made uh, to the 415,000 uh, people eligible for the payment uh, automatically over the course of February and March. And Ariane Burgess. Apologies. I, I meant to unpress my button and not call this question. Apologies, presiding officer. Thank you. Um, that concludes First Minister's questions.